Hello, and thank you for joining me for another of our LVS webinars. Today, we're going to talk about lung patterns. But before we start, a brief introduction. My name is Ian Jones, and I'm the radiologist at London Veterinary Specialists. I graduated from the Royal Veterinary College in 2004 and got my RCVS imaging certificate in 2009. Um, I did my residency at the RVC between 2013 and 2016, and I got my European diploma in 2018. And you can find me um, in the very heart of London um, in a multidisciplinary referral hospital called London Veterinary Specialists. If you have any questions or queries at all about anything imaging, um, then please feel free to drop me a line um, or send me an email, and I will do everything that I possibly can to assist you. Today's webinar is essentially a review of a chapter taken from a book that I became very familiar with during my residency. Uh, for me, it is the Bible of Veterinary Diagnostic Imaging, and it's a textbook by Donald Thrall. Uh, we'll be looking at chapter 33, which details lung patterns, and I'd highly recommend this book to any of you that have any interest in learning about veterinary diagnostic imaging. I think we're on to the seventh edition now. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with is this one. It's the sixth edition, and I'm already starting to get a little bit long in the tooth. So when I spoke to students during my residency about things about radiology they found most confusing, almost without exception, they'd mention lung patterns. It's something that a lot of vets a lot of students, a lot of nurses have problems with, and there are various reasons for that. Um, the first thing is the nomenclature. So there are lots of non-specific words that get used by radiologists when describing lung patterns. So we can use words like miliary or unstructured or reticular. Doing this presentation, I'm gonna keep it very simple to try and avoid any of the confusion surrounding the words that we should be using to describe lung patterns. The other thing that makes it difficult is that patients tend not to read the textbook and um, it's rare that we'll see a patient that has a single pattern. Um, often um, there'll be multiple patterns and uh, those patterns will be superimposed on each other, making it super confusing. My advice to you would be uh, pick the pattern that is most clinically significant. So describe and concentrate on those radiographic changes that are most likely contributing to the reason why this patient has presented. So why is this patient dyspneic? What is most likely causing this patient's dyspnea? And describe that. The other thing that we're going to mention um, is the distribution of the changes. So quite often uh, people will get hung up on deciding, is this interstitial pattern? Is this an alveolar pattern? I'm not really sure. We're at, with a really significant thing can be the distribution. It can tell us a lot about what might be responsible for those changes. So we'll touch a little bit on how we can use the distribution of the lung patterns, the distribution of the pathology to help us decide what is the cause of the patient's clinical signs and dyspnea. Before we do that, uh, we need to know a little bit about the anatomy of the lungs. Um, so uh, we've got uh, a right hemithorax, a left hemithorax, and in the right hemithorax, um, we've got the right lung lobes, and that's made up of the right cranial, the right middle, and the right caudal lung lobe. And that's because each of those lobes are supplied by a lobar bronchus. On the left, we've only got the cranial and the caudal lung lobe, um, but the left cranial lung lobe can be split, split up into a cranial segment um, and a caudal segment, but each of those segments don't have their own lobar bronchus. They branch off the left cranial lobar bronchus. And then we've got the accessory lung lobe. Once we know what lobes to look for, we need to know where to look for them on radiographs. So this is um, a lateral radiograph and very helpfully uh, we have some labels that tell us exactly what lung lobes we're looking at. So we have the uh, cranial lung lobe in the cranial thorax, we have the uh, right medial lung lobe superimposed over the cardiac silhouette and in the dorsal and caudal thorax and um, we've got the caudal lung lobes 
and then just superimposed over the caudal vena cava and the caudal part of the cardiac silhouette, um, we've got the accessory lung lobe. And if we look at a dorsoventral radiograph, uh, the lung lobes are really where you'd expect them to be. So the right and the left cranial lung lobes in the cranial thorax. Um, we've got the right middle in between the right cranial and the right caudal. And then we've got the left caudal um, in the left hemithorax caudally with the accessory lung lobe in the middle at the bottom. So if we know where the lung lobes are on a radiograph, then we can be a little bit more specific about describing the distribution of any lung patterns, of any pathology that we think might be present when we're evaluating thoracic radiographs. As well as knowing where the lung lobes are, we need to know what the lung consists of. And that can also help us understand why we use lung patterns to describe radiographic changes. So the pulmonary parenchyma um, is made up of the interstitium, which is the connective tissue between all of the other structures that are within the lung. Uh, we've got alveoli uh, within the pulmonary parenchyma. Uh, we've also got uh, bronchi and we've got vessels. So in amongst all of those different lung lobes we've just talked about, um, we have uh, alveoli, bronchi and vessels and we've got the interstitium in between all of them. And if we keep that in mind, that can help us understand why we use the terms we use to describe the lung patterns. So the lung patterns, and these are the only ones we're going to talk about today, because uh, I think uh, it, they pretty much cover most things. There are a couple of exceptions, but if we stick to interstitial, alveolar, bronchial, uh, vascular, and then finally uh, we'll touch on nodules and masses, which aren't specifically lung patterns, but uh, often the reason why we're uh, looking at thoracic radiographs, then uh, we're not going to miss out on too much. So when I'm describing thoracic radiographs, it's rare that I'll need to use any other terms other than this is an interstitial lung pattern and it's uh, in the dorsocaudal thorax. This is an alveolar lung pattern that has a ventral distribution and is confined to the right middle lung lobe. Uh, this is a diffuse bronchial pattern. Um, this is a vascular pattern where the pulmonary veins are enlarged relative to the pulmonary arteries, um, or uh, say things like there are multiple small, clearly marginated soft tissue opaque nodules throughout the pulmonary parenchyma, or maybe something like there's a large, solitary, clearly marginated soft tissue opaque mass within the right caudal lung lobe. And all of those radiographic descriptions that I've just used are only using the words that we've just covered. We don't need to make it any more complicated than that. It's hard enough to understand as it is, so let's try and keep it simple. So the first pattern is an interstitial pattern, and if we come back to thinking about the anatomy of the pulmonary parenchyma, we said that the lung is made up of alveoli, bronchi, and pulmonary vessels with interstitium in between them all. So the interstitium is kind of like the connective tissue, kind of like the, the, the sponge, the glue that holds all of those other structures together. And if you have an interstitial pattern, what that means is that there's infiltrate within the interstitium. So there's, there's infiltrate um, within and between all of those pulmonary structures. There's no infiltrate within the alveoli, the bronchi are normal, the pulmonary vessels are normal, but there's infiltrate in between a lot of them. And what that happens is that you have a, an increase in opacity. So the pulmonary parenchyma is more opaque than it should be because there's infiltrate within the interstitium, but it's not so opaque that you can't see the other structures. So if you have an interstitial pattern, the opacity will be increased, but the pulmonary vessels will still be visible. Now, interstitial patterns are really nonspecific. So if you see an interstitial pattern, it could really be caused by anything, um, ranging from poor radiographic technique to a patient having heart failure and it being cardiogenic edema. So the presence of an interstitial pattern doesn't really tell you very much, but um, it's important that we know how to recognize one. 
And we can do that by looking at a normal section of lung. So this is a DV radiograph, and we're just concentrating um, on the left caudal lung lobe here. And this is how the lung should look. So uh, we have a radiolucent lung, and we have the pulmonary architecture clearly visible. So within that radiolucent lung, um, we can clearly see the pulmonary vessels. Um, we've got a beautifully clearly marginated diaphragm. Um, we can see the cardiac silhouette really clearly. Um, we've got uh, the ribs as well, which have a mineralized opacity, so they're more opaque um, than uh, the cardiac silhouette and the uh, pulmonary vessels within the lung. So that's a very normal lung lobe. That's what it should look like. So let's compare that to an abnormal lung. So we've got normal on the left, and we've got a lung that has an interstitial pattern on the right. So if we essentially try and play spot the difference here. Hopefully you guys can appreciate that the opacity of the left caudal lung lobe on the right is increased relative to the normal lung on the left. So it's it's more radiopaque, but it's not so radiopaque that we can't still see um, some of the pulmonary architecture. So we can still see some of the vessels um, within this lung lobe. Um, we can still see the margins of the diaphragm, the cardiac silhouette. Um, it's an interstitial pattern. It's generalized, it's affecting all of this lobe. It's increased in opacity, um, but it's not so opaque that we're not able to see the rest of the pulmonary architecture. So that makes it an interstitial pattern. And this is how it might look in a lateral view relative to a dorsoventral view. So again, there's this focal area within the dorsocaudal lung that is increased in opacity. It has a very uh, indistinct margins. So we're not looking at a mass lesion here because the margins really are um, very difficult to see. The opacity is increased, but we can still see the pulmonary architecture underneath. Um, so this is a focal interstitial pattern within the dorsocaudal lung. Now, there are a few other things to mention with uh, interstitial patterns. And this uh, radiograph, which is um, a dorsoventral, uh, it's uh, centered a little bit more cranial than the previous radiographs. So we're looking at the uh, right cranial and the right middle lung lobes here. So the right middle lung lobe, which is just here, uh, looks normal. So has um, a normal radiopacity for a lung lobe. So it's radiolucent um, relative to the uh, pulmonary architecture, the pulmonary vessels within, and the adjacent uh, ribs, soft tissues, and cardiac silhouette. And just next to it, we've got the right cranial lung lobe, and that is increased in opacity. Now, um, it's uh, increased in opacity, but we can still see some of the pulmonary architecture, so that makes it a, an interstitial pattern. And because it's uh, adjacent to this normal gas-filled right middle lung lobe, we can see a really clear margin between the right middle lung lobe and the right cranial lung lobe. And this is an example of um, a lobar sign. Um, so we can see a very clear border separating these two lung lobes because we've got interstitial infiltrate creating this interstitial pattern in the right cranial lung lobe and a normal right middle lung lobe. Um, so that's a nice example of um, a lobar sign. Just before we move on to uh, alveolar change, um, it's worth mentioning atelectasis. So um, atelectasis can be a real problem. So uh, oftentimes uh, we are evaluating thoracic radiographs where patients may have been in lateral recumbency for a prolonged period. Uh, for me, that often happens where we decide that a patient might need thoracic films after an abdominal ultrasound. So this patient has been in right lateral recumbency uh, for uh, 35 minutes, say, for the abdominal ultrasound. Uh, we found something in the abdomen that we're concerned about, and now we need to do a MET check and take some thoracic radiographs. But because the patient has been in right lateral for so long, um, it means that we've got collapse of the lung lobes, and, and that's where you get atelectasis. So uh, with atelectasis, so lung lobes that are collapsed because of prolonged lateral recumbency, the lung lobes are going to look more opaque, uh, but significantly, they're going to be reduced in volume. So lung lobes um, that are atelectic, 
that, that are collapsed. Um, they don't contain as much gas as normal aerated lung. And because of that, they're reduced in volume and increased in opacity. And because of that reduction in volume, you get an associated mediastinal shift. So a mediastinal shift is when the um, mediastinum and mediastinal structures, including the heart, shift to one side of the thorax. And that can happen because of a reduction in volume. So um, if, say, some lung lobes collapse, then the mediastinal structures, including the cardiac silhouette, will shift to fill that void. And sometimes it can happen because of a mass effect. So if you have a space-occupying lesion within the lung, particularly a very large space-occupying lesion, like a large mass, that can push the mediastinum from one side to the other. In this DV radiograph, uh, we're looking at an atelectic uh, left lung. So uh, the cardiac silhouette um, has shifted to the left, and the left cranial and caudal lung lobes um, are reduced in volume and they're increased in opacity. So that is um, a collapsed and atelectic left cranial and left caudal lung lobe. You could potentially describe the pattern within the collapsed left cranial and left caudal lung lobes as interstitial, but it's it's more than likely that the changes that we're seeing here are as a result of a position of atelectasis uh, rather than something pathological. So when you guys are evaluating radiographs, um, make sure that you're aware of atelectasis and make sure that you know how to tell the difference between an atelectic lung and a lung that is full of interstitial infiltrate. Significantly, a lung that is atelectic will be reduced in volume because it'll be collapsed. A lung that is full of interstitial infiltrate because of some sort of pathology, it'll have a normal volume, but it'll be increased in opacity. So just watch out for that. So an alveolar pattern um, is where not only do we have infiltrate within the interstitium, so not only do we have infiltrate within all of the tissue connecting all of the pulmonary architecture, we also have infiltrate within the alveoli. And because we have infiltrate within the interstitium and within the, al the alveoli, we're not able to see any of the rest of the pulmonary architecture. So we can't see the pulmonary vasculature and all we can see is the gas within the bronchi of the affected lung. And the gas that's in the bronchi that gets highlighted by this infiltrate that's within the interstitium and within the alveoli is called an air bronchogram. And again, try and keep it simple. If you can see air bronchograms, then it's an alveolar pattern. So if there's a generalized increase in opacity, but you can still see the pulmonary architecture and there are no air bronchograms, then it's an interstitial pattern. If you can see air bronchograms, then that means that there must be infiltrate both within the interstitium and within the alveoli. And therefore it has to be an alveolar pattern. Air bronchograms mean an alveolar pattern. And if you've never seen an air bronchogram before, this is what an air bronchogram looks like. <clears throat> so uh, here we're looking at a lateral thoracic radiograph. We're looking at the craniaventral thorax. And we can see there's an, an increase in radiopacity of the pulmonary parenchyma in the craniaventral thorax. So much so that we've got effacement of the borders of the cardiac silhouette. It's hard to know exactly where that cardiac silhouette ends, but more specifically, we've got this beautiful branching radiolucent structure that is almost within the center of the area that's increased in opacity. And this is um, a beautiful air bronchogram, and there are multiple air bronchograms in this radiograph. And the fact that we can see these air bronchograms means that this change represents an alveolar pattern. And more specifically, we can say that this is an alveolar pattern that has a ventral distribution. And we'll talk a little bit more about why that's very significant later on during the presentation. So what I want you guys to take away from this is that if you can see ear bronchograms, then it's an alveolar pattern. And an alveolar pattern is more severe than an interstitial pattern, because if you have an alveolar pattern, then whatever infiltrate is in the interstitium is also within the alveoli. And so if I saw 
uh, a patient that was dyspneic and we took some thoracic radiographs and I could see an alveolar pattern within the, say, right middle lung lobe. And there were some patchy areas of interstitial infiltrate. I'm not going to concentrate on the interstitial infiltrate and the interstitial pattern. I'm going to describe the alveolar pattern because that's what's most likely causing the dyspnea. So ear bronchograms means an alveolar pattern. And just like the interstitial pattern, an alveolar pattern, it, it's not specific. So an alveolar pattern can be caused by pneumonia. It can be caused by edema, whether it be cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. Um, you can have it in patients that have redenticide toxicity or lungworm because of hemorrhage. Um, you can have it in patients that have neoplasia. So this change, it's, it's not specific, just like an interstitial pattern, but it's important to know how to recognize it. Um, so uh, it, if you see a patient that has an alveolar pattern, then there's going to be lots of things on your differential list. But it's important that you guys know the difference between an interstitial pattern, an alveolar pattern, and how to recognize it. So hopefully now that's a little bit more clear. So before we move on to the bronchi, um, we'll talk about distribution. And this is something that I learned during my residency, and it's something that is super helpful. So oftentimes we get so hung up on getting the lung pattern correct. Um, we get so anxious about whether this is an interstitial pattern or an alveolar pattern, or does this have a bronchial component? Uh, we forget about describing the distribution. And often the distribution of these changes can be way more useful in helping us decide what the inciting cause is, whether is this interstitial or is, is this alveolar. So the changes that you can see, whether they're interstitial or alveolar, if they have a ventral distribution, it's much more likely that that patient has pneumonia. If they have a dorsal and a caudal distribution, it's much more likely that what you're looking at is a patient with edema. Now, cardiologists will say uh, that's true for dogs. So dogs that have heart failure, the edema is most likely going to occur, to occur within the hyalur region and the dorsal caudal thorax. That isn't true for cats. So in cats, the edema can be pretty much anywhere. Um, but generally speaking, if you have interstitial or alveolar change and it has a predominantly ventral distribution, then you're probably looking at a dog with pneumonia. If you have a patient that has an interstitial or alveolar change and it has a hyalur, a dorsal or a caudal distribution, you're probably looking at a patient that either has uh, cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic edema. Be careful with cats in heart failure, that doesn't really apply, but generally speaking, ventral is pneumonia, dorsal and caudal is edema, okay? So the other component of the lung that we need to talk about um, is the bronchi. Um, so uh, the uh, bronchi um, permeate all of the lung. And we go from the trachea to the main stem bronchi, bronchi to the lobar bronchi. And a bronchial pattern essentially just means that the bronchial walls are too thick. And in thoracic radiographs, that usually manifests itself <coughs> as rings and tram lines. So if you're looking at either a lateral or a dorsoventral radiograph, and you can see uh, little radio opaque rings um, or tram lines, then you're probably looking at a patient that has um, bronchial disease because what you're looking at is a bronchial pattern. Now, uh, a bronchial pattern, again, it's, it's non-specific, but uh, almost always when you see a bronchial pattern, um, it's because of um, either a chronic bronchitis or uh, allergic airway disease, uh, particularly in cats. Um, there are other reasons why a patient might have a bronchial pattern. So uh, sometimes it can occur as a result of cardiogenic pulmonary edema um, or parasitic disease. Um, so uh, again, um, cats that have um, allurostrongolus um, can have a bronchial pattern. Generally speaking, it's either because they've got bronchitis or it's because they've got feline allergic airway disease um, or both. Um, just a word of caution, particularly when you're evaluating uh, the radiographs of more elderly patients, particularly elderly cats, um, a, a bronchial pattern, so uh, thickening of the bronchi, can be just an incidental age variant. So if you see rings and tram lines in a 14-year-old cat that is otherwise asymptomatic, I wouldn't get too excited about that. If you see uh, rings and tram lines in a four-year-old cat that's coughing, then that's certainly compatible um, with feline allergic airway disease. Um, so rings and tram lines are what we're looking for when we're diagnosing a bronchial pattern. And this is uh, what they look like. Um, so here we can see this patient um, has got multiple rings. So these are the, the little rings or, or donuts that 
um, represent uh, thickened bronchial walls, um, and these are the tram lines. So uh, they're a little bit harder to see um, than the rings, I think, um, but these represent thickened bronchial walls um, in longitudinal section, effectively, and these represent thickened bronchial walls in um, a short axis section. So if you see rings and tram lines, then those represent thick bronchial walls, and that means that you can be confident in describing that as a bronchial pattern. So just um, a variation on a theme. Um, so a word that you might uh, hear radiologists use occasionally is bronchiectasis. Um, so uh, bronchiectasis is uh, something that can happen in a patient that has severe chronic bronchial disease. And uh, we recognize it um, because the bronchi are markedly increased in size. Um, so uh, the bronchi are really big. Um, they don't taper as they move towards the periphery um, of the uh, thoracic wall. Uh, the bronchial walls um, often look quite undulating. So uh, they're quite wibbly wobbly, these bronchial walls. They're non-linear. They're not straight, beautiful tram lines. Uh, and often the bronchial walls um, are quite thick. So if you see bronchi that are big, they don't taper. They have non-linear bronchial walls that are thick, then you can start thinking about using the term bronchiectasis in your radiographic description. And this is an example of um, a lateral thoracic radiograph of a patient that has bronchiectasis. And hopefully uh, you guys can appreciate that we've got a whole bunch of, of rings or donuts and, and tram lines here. And if we look a little bit more closely at some of these bronchi, we, we can see that they're way thicker than we'd expect them to be. And more specifically, as we move from the hyla region here towards the periphery of the thorax, th these don't taper at all. So th these bronchi are almost as, as wide here, closer to the periphery as they are closer to the hilus, and they really should be tapering to a point, particularly as you get to the ventral thorax here, close to the thoracic wall. And these bronchi are, are not tapering at all. They're, they're too big, the walls are too thick, and they're also undulating. And this is a, a patient that has bronchiectasis secondary to severe chronic bronchial disease. So that's what bronchiectasis looks like. That's how you diagnose it. Um, so uh, yeah, look out for it. Um, certainly there are patients out there that, that have chronic bronchial disease that will have these sorts of changes. So next time you see one, you'll be able to nail it as a patient with bronchiectasis. Just uh, following on uh, from a bronchial disease and the sorts of things that you might see in patients with chronic bronchial disease. Um, emphysema, so uh, gas trapping within the lung, so effectively uh, gas within the interstitium. So we talked about infiltrate within the interstitium when we were talking about an interstitial pattern. Now we're talking about gas within the interstitium, and, and that's um, gas trapping within the pulmonary parenchyma or pulmonary emphysema. And you often see this um, in cats that have chronic bronchial disease um, or feline allergic airway disease. And what you'll see is um, very radiolucent lungs. Um, so because the lung contains more gas than it should, um, it'll look more radiolucent. Um, so not only is there gas within the alveoli, there's also gas within the interstitium around the alveoli. So they're super gas filled. So they look really radiolucent. Um, they'll be hyperinflated. So they'll be bigger than they should be because they contain more gas than they should. And because they're hyperinflated, uh, the diaphragm will look flat. Um, and if you're really lucky, um, then you might see tenting of the diaphragm as well. So this is a lateral thoracic radiograph of a patient that has pulmonary emphysema. Um, we can see that the diaphragm um, is, is really flat. So normally we'd expect the diaphragm to have a concave shape. Um, there's an increase in the space between the caudal border of the cardiac silhouette and the diaphragmatic crura. Um, so this, this diaphragm, as well as being flat, it's pushed a little bit more caudal than I'd expect it to be. And also the lung is uh, quite radiolucent. Um, so generally speaking, the opacity of this pulmonary parenchyma is reduced relative to how we'd expect it to appear. So it's a radiolucent lung. And all of those changes uh, mean that this patient most likely has a pulmonary emphysema. Um, and you'll often see this um, in cats that have asthma. So a lot of these cats, as well as having bronchial changes, uh, they can have collapse of the right middle lung lobe as well, um, and even rib fractures. So a lot of cats that have um, asthma and do a lot of coughing, they'll break their ribs. So as well as looking at all of these uh, changes to the pulmonary parenchyma, um, it's often worth just 
keeping an eye on the ribs as well because there'll be some rib fractures there that you might miss. Um, so pulmonary emphysema, um, certainly something that you're going to see in cats with uh, asthma, feline allergic airway disease, chronic bronchitis. Now this is the tenting of the diaphragm that I mentioned to you. And what we're looking at here is, is a VD radiograph. And we, we can see that at various points on the diaphragmatic crura, so um, where the uh, diaphragm joins to the costal arch, we can see this sort of pinching um, of the margins of the diaphragm. And that's something that we can refer to as tenting of the diaphragm. And that's uh, also something that is associated with gas trapping with pulmonary emphysema. So, uh, the idea is that the lung is, is so full of air because we've got gas trapped within the interstitium. The diaphragm is, is pushed cordially, um, leading to tension at the points where the diaphragm attaches to the costal arch. And because of that tension, um, you get tenting of the diaphragmatic crura. So that's what we're looking at there. Uh, I don't think I've, I've seen that very often, to be honest. Um, certainly seen tons of cats with asthma that have a, a bronchial lung pattern. They have changes compatible with pulmonary emphysema. They have collapse of their right middle lung lobe rib fractures. Not seeing so many with this tenting of the diaphragm, but it's, it's been described. Um, it is out there, um, so keep an eye out for it. So as well as having uh, interstitium, as well as having alveoli um, and bronchi within the lungs, we've also got the pulmonary vasculature. So we've got pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. So the first thing to know is, well, how do we know which is an artery and which is a vein? And there's an easy way to remember. So if you're looking at a lateral radiograph, then veins are ventral. If you're looking at a dorsal ventral radiograph or a ventral dorsal radiograph, then veins are central. So if you remember veins are ventral and veins are central, then you're always going to be able to tell whether you're looking at a pulmonary artery or a pulmonary vein. And how do you know whether these vessels are too big? Well, they, they should always be smaller than the thickness of the adjacent rib. So if you're looking at a vessel and it's way bigger than the rib that it's next to, then essentially it's bigger than it should be. So veins are ventral, veins are central, and they should always be smaller than the thickness of the adjacent rib. So uh, this is another lateral radiograph. Uh, we're focused on the craniaventral thorax, and we're looking at the right cranial lobar bronchus, which is here. This is a lateral radiograph, um, so veins are ventral. So that must mean that this structure here is the pulmonary vein, and this structure here is the pulmonary artery. Okay, so in a lateral radiograph, veins are ventral. That must mean this is the vein, and this is the artery. If we look at a DV radiograph, then um, veins are central. So let's look for one of the caudal lobar bronchi. Um, so this is uh, a caudal lobar bronchus and veins are central. So that must mean that, that this is the pulmonary vein and this is the pulmonary artery. Okay, so look for the bronchus, veins are central, this is a DV, which means this is the pulmonary vein and this is the pulmonary artery. Okay, so once we know how to tell which is a vein and which is an artery, then we can think about the different uh, permutations we can have in patients that have a vascular lung pattern. And there are only a couple. So either the arteries can be big, or uh, the veins can be big, or they both can be big, or they both can be small. So if you're looking at a patient that has big pulmonary arteries relative to the pulmonary veins, then the things on your differential list should include some verminous disease, um, like lungworm or heartworm, um, or thromboembolic disease, so PTE, pulmonary thromboembolism. If you're looking at a patient whose pulmonary veins are way bigger than the pulmonary arteries, then um, you're thinking about uh, cardiac problems, and all of the major ones are here. So patients with mitral insufficiency, with dilated cardiomyopathy, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they're all going to have big veins relative to the arteries. And patients in heart failure, they'll also have big, chunky pulmonary veins. If you have uh, patients that have big arteries and veins. So if you look at the pulmonary vasculature and you think, wow, both the arteries and the veins are, are way thicker than an adjacent rib, what could that be? Um, then usually you're looking at congenital heart disease. Um, so shunting congenital disease like uh, PDAs, uh, so patent dextroteriosis, and vent, uh, vent ventricular and atrial septal defects. Um, you don't see them that often, but if you see huge pulmonary vessels, then think about left to right, um, shunting congenital cardiac disease like PDAs, VSDs, and ASDs. So just as 
uh, an addition. Um, you can sometimes look at a, a thoracic radiograph and think, wow, uh, I, I think those vessels are way smaller than they should be. Um, so looking at this uh, right lateral thoracic radiograph, we, we, we can look for the right cranial lobar bronchus and it's around here and we, we can look at the vessels and they're not that easy to see. And then we can look at the caudal vena cava and think, wow, that's actually way smaller than it should be. You, you might take a glance at this and think, well, has this patient got a pneumothorax because this heart looks elevated relative to the sternum, but th this isn't gas within the, the pleural space here because I can still see the pulmonary architecture in this tissue. So this is actually lung rather than gas. What, what could be causing this? So if you see a patient that has really small arteries and veins, then it could be that that patient is really hypovolemic. And this is a patient that was profoundly hypovolemic because of Addison's disease. Um, there are other possible causes that are much more rare. So for example, if you have um, a congenital cardiac disease like uh, tetralogy, uh, where you get uh, right to left shunting rather than left to right shunting, that can give you uh, really small pulmonary vessels. But the you're much more likely to see it in patients that are hypovolemic. Um, so just have that in mind. If you take a thoracic radiograph and you think, wow, the heart looks small, the caudal vena cava looks small, uh, the lung looks quite sort of radiolucent, um, and I'm really struggling to see the vessels, that, that patient is probably profoundly hypovolemic and would really benefit from some aggressive fluid therapy. So um, that's certainly something that you guys should be aware of. So it, it's really common to take thoracic radiographs because you're doing a MET check. So uh, I've said earlier that you know, we have problems with atelectasis where we're taking thoracic radiographs after abdominal ultrasounds, and that's invariably because we're doing a MET check. So we're looking for any evidence of pulmonary metastasis. So we're looking for nodules, essentially. And um, typically, nodules um, are going to be clearly marginated. They're going to be round. Um, they're going to have a soft tissue opacity, and they're going to be small. And you can classify a nodule as being anything between about four millimeters and, and two centimeters. And um, significantly, there, there should be multiple nodules. So um, a, a dog or a cat that has pulmonary metastasis, typically there'll be numerous soft tissue opaque nodules throughout the pulmonary parenchyma. Um, as a word of caution, if you see a solitary pulmonary nodule, then just take a second to think, does this patient have any cutaneous lumps and bumps that might be masquerading as a pulmonary nodule, particularly if you can only see it in, in one view, say a lateral view, and is this definitely a nodule and not a nipple? So what you absolutely don't want to do is you don't want to diagnose a patient with pulmonary metastasis because it has a subcutaneous lipoma. So something you can do if there is any doubt at all as to is this genuinely a pulmonary nodule or a mass because this is an old Labrador and it's just got tons of lipomas all over it, is you can just pop a little blob of barium on the cutaneous lumps and the nipples and then retake the thoracic radiographs. And anything that has a barium blob on it is going to be a cutaneous lump or a nipple and not a pulmonary nodule. Um, so uh, just be mindful of that. Um, we certainly don't want to be diagnosing old dogs that have multiple cutaneous lipomas with pulmonary metastasis. Masses, unlike nodules, tend to be uh, solitary. Um, they have a soft tissue opacity, just like nodules. Um, they usually um, and hopefully have nice, clean, discrete margins. They're bigger than nodules, so greater than two centimeters in diameter. Um, in terms of their distribution, um, they, they tend to be peribronchial, so they'll, they'll form around the bronchus, and they can be um, partially mineralized. Um, so uh, if you see any evidence of mineralization associated with a soft tissue opacity that has a peribronchial location um, is relatively big, so more than two centimeters. It has clear, discrete margins um, and it is solitary, then chances are um, you're looking at a pulmonary mass. And most commonly, um, pulmonary mass lesions um, are going to be um, uh, neoplastic. Um, so a pulmonary adenocarcinomas would be the most common cause. Um, there, there are other things they could be. Um, so you know, if you have a big pulmonary mass and it's not something neoplastic, it, it could be a hematoma, it could be a granuloma, um, it could potentially be an abscess. Um, so, uh, for example, you know, if, you, if you've if you got a two-year-old English Springer Spaniel that has had a bilateral 
nasal discharge and has been coughing for a long time and you take a thoracic radiograph and you, know, you see a, a big soft tissue a, a, a mass within its dorsocaudal thorax that looks like it might have a dorsal gas cap, then you need to think, well, this actually could be an abscess secondary to a migrating foreign body like a grass seed. Um, but more often than not, if you see these big solitary mass lesions within the lungs of, of all the dogs, particularly if they're partially mineralized, it's going to be something sinister like an abnormal carcinoma. Um, for nodules, if, if you see a solitary nodule, then I wouldn't get too excited about that. So, so a solitary nodule, again, could be anything. It could be a hematoma, it could be a granuloma. If you see multiple nodules, so if you have a patient that has you know, hemangios, blank hemangiosarcoma and you see multiple soft tissue nodules within the lung, then chances are it's going to be pulmonary metastasis. But uh, don't get too excited about solitary nodules. You really can't tell anything from a sort of solitary nodule. I, I would be reluctant to diagnose pulmonary metastasis in, in a patient on the basis of a single solitary nodule. So this is an example of uh, a slam dunk lung mass, essentially. So we're looking at a right caudal lung lobe. We've got um, a large, clearly marginated, solitary, soft tissue opaque mass um, within the right caudal lung lobe. And, and that's um, a lung mass, no question. And I think this patient turned out to have uh, something sinister like an adenocarcinoma. Um, so that's what a typical pulmonary mass um, is going to look like. So I just, um, for a bit of a giggle, we'll have a game of, of nodule or not. So the idea is that we look at a couple of examples of pulmonary pathology and try and decide whether the lesions are a nodule um, or not. Are they something else? So in this first radiograph, um, we've got a couple of possible candidates. So uh, more cranially, um, we've got a small, clearly marginated, round soft tissue opacity, which could absolutely be a nodule. And we've got a few other structures that look very similar. So uh, we've got uh, a, a smaller soft tissue opaque structure that's just adjacent to this bronchus. And um, it's got a neighbor, which has a very similar radiographic appearance. And both of these structures and the bronchus um, are very closely opposed to these pulmonary vessels. So we've got artery, bronchus, vein, and, and they're very, very close. And these are pulmonary vessels, and this is a nodule. So we have another example of a lung that looks abnormal. Uh, here we've got numerous, small, clearly marginated, radiopaque structures throughout the pulmonary parenchyma. And these structures are, are really small. So these structures are less than four millimeters thick. So for them to show up on this radiograph, they must really be quite dense. In fact, these structures are, are too small to be nodules because they probably have at least partly a mineralized component. And because of that, these structures are much more likely to be just incidental heterotopic bone rather than nodules. So these structures, this, this heterotopic bone, or uh, if you go back a couple of years, pulmonary osteomata, um, are just incidental age-related changes. So this, this is not pulmonary metastasis. These are just little areas of heterotopic bone in an older dog. And the reason why we can be confident is because they're too small and too dense to be nodules. So if you see these sorts of changes, do not be diagnosing dogs with pulmonary metastasis. This is incidental age-related change. It's pulmonary heterotopic bone. So if you've never seen it, that's what it looks like. So this one looks a little different. So uh, we have a small, clearly marginated, round, soft tissue opaque structure superimposed over the cardiac silhouette. Now, unlike the first one we looked at, this structure isn't really anywhere near any of the pulmonary vasculature um, or the bronchi. It's really difficult to make this structure an end-on vessel. It's, it's too big and it's not really in the right place. And it's difficult to know what else this structure could be other than a pulmonary nodule. Um, it's also uh, bigger than the structures that we evaluated in the last radiograph. So this thing is going to be more than four millimeters thick. So I think this one was actually about eight millimeters thick. So this is, this is a nodule. So this is an example of a pulmonary nodule. So this one is a little bit different. So here we've got a large, round, 
clearly marginated structure within the dorsocaudal thorax. It has a radiopaque periphery and it has a radiolucent center. So uh, this structure doesn't look like a nodule. Um, a nodule certainly shouldn't have a center that has a gas opacity. So what else could this be? Well, this is a typical appearance for a pulmonary bulla. Um, so uh, dogs and cats will occasionally get these uh, gas-filled cavities within their pulmonary parenchyma called bully. Um, they're, they're usually incidental. They can rupture, resulting in a spontaneous pneumothorax. But oftentimes when they rupture, you can't see them because they've collapsed and caused the pneumothorax. But this is what they look like. Um, they're often very clearly marginated, beautifully round, have radiopaque peripheries and uh, radiolucent centers. So this is an example of a pulmonary bulla. So just before we uh, finish, I thought we would just touch on pleural effusion. Now, strictly speaking, pleural effusion is something that affects the pleural space, not the pulmonary parenchyma. It's not an example of a lung pattern, but uh, oftentimes in patients that have primary pulmonary disease, they'll have effusion as well as all the other things that we talked about, interstitial, alveolar, bronchial patterns. So it's important that you guys know how to recognize pleural effusion. Um, we may very well do another webinar looking at pleural space disease. So this is just dipping our toe in the water of the pulmonary pleura. We'll just talk very briefly about how to recognize pleural effusion. And essentially what we're looking at is we're looking for any evidence of effacement of the borders of the cardiac silhouette. So if you can't see the heart and the thoracic cavity looks more opaque than it should, then that's a good, there's a good chance that there's pleural effusion. Um, if you see retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic walls, then that's a good indication that this patient might have pleural effusion. And if you see fissure lines. So we talked a little bit about uh, pulmonary anatomy and the different lung lobes. Fissure lines are essentially what happens when you get fluid in between the different lung lobes. Not the same as a lobar sign. The lobar sign is where you have a diseased lung lobe sat against a normal lung lobe. And the difference in density and opacity between the two creates a border, which is called a lobar sign. A fissure line is something different. A fissure line is where you have fluid in between the two lung lobes. So if you see a face effacement of the cardiac silhouette, if you see a retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall, and if you see fissure lines, and if generally speaking, the thorax looks more opaque than it should, particularly the ventral thorax and the lateral views, then chances are you've got a patient that has pleural effusion. And just like a, a lot of these changes, again, it's non-specific. So pleural effusion could really be anything. So if you see a patient that has pleural effusion, there's no way really of telling whether it's a transudate, a modified transudate, an exudate. Is it hemorrhage? Is this dog bleeding into its pleural space? Does it have a chylothorax? Who knows? We, we can't tell just by looking at the radiographs. And my advice to you would be if you see a patient that has pleural effusion, then tap it and remove as much fluid as possible. Repeat the radiographs because it's going to be easier for you to assess the pulmonary parenchyma without that fluid, and then take the fluid off to the lab to decide what it is to get a diagnosis. The only exception that I mentioned would be uh, cats that have a pyothorax. So pyothorax in cats will typically present as a small volume unilateral pleural effusion. So if you have uh, a young cat that's a bit of a bruiser and is always out fighting and he presents pyrexic and, dis and a little bit dyspneic and you take some thoracic radiographs and you think well I think this cat has a small volume unilateral pleural effusion then in that case I'd be inclined to say you know what? I think this cat probably has a pyothorax otherwise it's pretty non-specific. So this is what um, pleural effusion looks like. So this is a DV radiograph of a dog with a moderate volume pleural effusion. So uh, we, we can't see the heart here at all, but the heart should be here, right in the middle of the thorax. We can't see it. So there's effacement of the borders of the cardiac silhouette. Um, we can see some fissure lines as well. So there's a fissure line here. So this is gonna be the fissure line between the right caudal and the right middle lung lobe. And then we've got retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall. So the edge of the lung here should be right up against the thoracic wall. And instead, we've got this uh, radiopaque material separating the two and retracting the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall. So this patient unquestionably has pleural effusion. 
effacement of the cardiac silhouette, pleural fissure lines in a bunch of different places, and retraction of the pulmonary parenchyma from the thoracic wall. This is a lateral radiograph of, of that same patient. Um, the uh, pleural fissure lines are much harder to see here, and we can see one dorsally, but we still have effacement of the cardiac silhouette. So um, really tricky to, to see where that cardiac silhouette starts and ends, uh, particularly cranially. We've got an increase in opacity um, in the ventral thorax. And all of those changes together mean that we can be super confident that this patient has a pleural effusion and we should tap it, remove as much as possible, repeat the radiographic thoracic study, and then send some of that fluid off to the lab so uh, we can find out exactly what it is. Okay. So I hope you guys enjoyed this webinar. Hopefully you feel a little bit more confident about lung patterns um, and describing some of the changes that you're going to see in all of those thoracic radiographs um, that you're going to take. Um, if uh, you have any questions about this webinar, then please drop me a line um, and uh, stay well, uh, stay safe, and I will see you guys again the next time. Bye bye.